exciting to, to have this opportunity to um, to have a chat with the, the JMC students because, as Amy mentioned at the end, um, you know, I, I was in your guys' position. It was, it was uh, yeah, 2003, 2004. And, um, you know, as a former uh, student, what, what I've tried to do is now that I've been able to work in the music industry is, is um, this opportunity gave me a chance to get my head back in that space of, of what it was like in 2003 where you're, uh, you know, you're dedicating yourself to education within the music industry with the goal of getting employment. And, and that's the, you know, that's the, the key and that's what everyone's going for. And there might be a little bit of sort of anxiety around that. I know for me, there was, I was there doing this course, you're trying to enter a pretty competitive industry. Um, but, you know, there, there's, there's never been a better time, guys. And, and I'll go through that. You know, I've got, I've got a bit of a deck to go through. I want to just keep it informal and looking forward to having a chat with you all and, and hearing some questions. But um, I, I tell you, an hour and a half is a pretty long time to talk, so I hope I don't lose you guys. But I'll, I'll just start with this first slide to, to tell you, I sort of put myself in the mindset of what I want the students to get out of this because this is what I wanted out of my sort of masterclasses, you know, back 15 years or however long ago it was. So, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna talk about my path, my path from education to, to professional. And the reason why I'm going to spend a bit of, bit of time on that is because I feel it's super relevant for you guys because you're in that exact position. So, you know, hopefully you might be able to take a couple of little little tips and tricks or, um, you know, a bit of faith or whatever it might be out of, you know, hearing, you know, my, my progression. Um, you know, I know everyone's interested in, like, how does a record label work and a, particularly a, a major record company. Um, so I, I want to just go through some of the fundamentals of that. Um, but then on top of that, all throughout, just overlay the experiences that I've had throughout it. So it sort of gives you guys a little bit of uh, sort of, a, you know, something tangible to, to, to take away from it rather than just going through, you know, spreadsheets of what departments are where. I want to talk about them in the context of you guys trying to get jobs in, in those, you know, parts of a label. Because um, I know that's, you know, that's on, let's say, everyone's lips. And then lucky last, I just want to, like spark the flame of optimism about trying to find a job, um, especially at the moment where, you know, we're, we're all going through this very uncertain time globally. Um, but you know, as I'll get to later in the chat, in 2003, if you guys remember, the, the industry, you know, was in free fall, you know, it was absolutely in free fall. Um, uh, with, the, with what piracy was doing to it. I remember lecturers at, at other um, institutions saying, you know, you're wasting your time. I don't know why you're doing a music industry course because there's no way that the industry can find its way through this piracy sort of epidemic. And what that was, what, 15, 17 years ago, and look where we are now. So, yes, this is really challenging. You know, life, the life scene's been, you know, really hit hard. But what, what I want to do is just, we'll talk through it and just let you know, guys, if, if you work hard enough, that there are plenty of jobs out there. The, the, the industry's actually never been in better shape. So, um, so that's kind of what I, that's breaking it down to something really simple. What I'm going to try, what I want you guys to get out of, out of the next, um, you know, hour and a bit. Um, and yeah, I'm looking forward to, to um, getting questions. So as I'm chatting through things, make sure you're jotting things down and we'll, um, we'll have a chat. But um, yeah, let me, as I mentioned, let me just first go through, through the path because I feel like it's, it's relevant. Um, so started out at JMC 2003, 2004. It was two years at JMC and it was great because it taught me, um, it taught me a little about a lot of things. That's what I took out of the curriculum back then. Um, and by the end of my time at, at JMC, um, I knew I wanted to work in the industry, but I didn't specifically know what. I thought it was going to be a label because I had a lecturer who said to me, you know, I think you would be good at, at promotions. I feel that's where you're going to land. But at that time, I'm thinking maybe band management, maybe um, you know, uh, publishing. I had a few things in my head. So at the end of those two years, finished JMC, but I really wanted to sort of get the degree component out, out of it. I'd finished two years of study. So jumped over to RMIT and did that last year of, of, a, of a Bachelor of Arts degree. Honestly, honestly, it was, it was a pretty rubbish degree, to be honest, um, what uh, RMIT offered. However, however, there was something in, there's a module, um, there was a module within the course that was 250 hours industry placement needed to do. Um, some people attacked it and actually got industry placement. Other people just got their mates to kind of fudge the, 
fudge the figures and went and did a couple of shifts at their um, their part time jobs to make a bit of extra money. Now that 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 moment there, my decision to actually apply myself and try and get some proper industry placement was sort of the catalyst for everything. Um, and and so really quickly with the ten weeks, I decided to try and get. Um, a little bit of experience in every part of the business I thought I'm, I might want to work in. So, you know, and that was a combination of cold calling, a combination of using some of the relationships I had, uh, a little bit of everything. Um, and, and so in a nutshell, I ended up securing two weeks at Shock Records um, from a label point of view. I did two weeks at Nova from a um, radio point of view. I did two weeks at the Herald Sun as from a journalist in their music department. I did two weeks at APRA because I thought, you know, from publishing and I did two weeks at a management company. So over the course of those 10 weeks, I felt like, right, I've got an idea of where I want to go with this and because could quickly sort of rule a few out. So new straight away publishing wasn't for me, new straight away band management wasn't for me. And after my time at Shock, I thought, right, this is, this is where I need to put my energies. Um, so, so Shock, um, after the two weeks that I did work experience, they, um, they wanted to, keep me around and uh, offered me offered me a role what we called the dungeon so it was five dollars an hour and uh, it was burning their their promo cds that went out to all the media laminating putting stickers on cds um, you know and i'm 21 at that stage so it's not like you know i was a 15 year old work experience kid i was you know i, I was at an age where you know i still had to go right I, I, I this is not easy for me to be doing this but it's got got a foot in the door so i had a foot in the door at shock and then after Herald Sun, the two weeks I had at Herald Sun, the journalist Cameron Adams, who's national music writer and still is, he knew I didn't want to be a journalist. So he said, listen, let me take you around to the labels. So we did a little bit of a, a visit around the labels and the guys at EMI said to me, oh, we need someone one day a week to come fill out our, our, our mail and post, post it off one day a week. So I said, yeah, sure, $15 an hour or something, let's do it. Um, and then the last one was Nova. So Nova, um, you know, we ha had a great time two weeks there and they said, oh, listen, we feel like you want to be a, a label guy. We'll keep you around. Do you want to be in the street team? So um, uh, another name for the street team are the Casanovas, believe it or not. Um, so, oh, yeah, I, I drove around the, the Nova cars and, and gave out free stuff because what that allowed me to do was get within the Nova building, build relationships with the radio people and see all the label people come through because all the label the promo people at a label go into radio stations to pitch music. So what I'm able, you know, within the space of a few months, was able to, to, to um, set myself up with uh, Monday, Tuesday at Shock, Wednesday at EMI, Thursday, Friday at Nova, and then Saturday, Sunday, I just worked at a, at a deli part-time. But that, that, that was me just going, right, I just need to get my foot in the door here. And while I'm here, just build as many networks as I can. So that was the first part, the first part of like, how long is that? So yeah, four years or so. Um, and, and that's just part-time stuff. Then I, I was able to, to secure that first job um, at, at Shock as a full-time role. And uh, this, yeah, Shock after you know, nearly a year said, listen, we want you to come be a regional radio plugger. So regional radio at the time is the absolute bottom of the food chain for, for, a, uh, for a promotions person. And what that is, is just calling up, you know, your Ballarats and your Albury's and your, uh, I don't know, any, anywhere you can think of from a regional point of view, Bendigo and all those, um, and just trying to get these songs played. Now, I'm trying to get songs on commercial radio. I'm working for an Indian. I'm calling regional radio stations. So that was a really tough gig. But what it did is it sort of fueled the, the hustle. Um, and, and over time, using the relationships that I've built at, at Nova, Shock thought, right, we've got this guy, he's doing regional radio, but he knows everyone at Nova because he's worked there. So let's utilize him. And, and bit by bit, I sort of progressed my way through through the ranks and, and eventually was, was doing national promotion for Shock, as well as a million other things, because that's what you do at an indie, right? You, it's all hands on deck. Um, yeah, by the time I left Shock, I was doing marketing, I was doing promo, I was doing digital, I was doing advertising, uh, and I was doing licensing. So that's, and it was, and it was awesome. It was such a great grounding um, for where I was to eventually get to. So, so then, you know, so I've got a full time job. I'm actually making some some okay, you know, a living out of it. And then, um, you know, again through the relationships, through the contacts that I've built while going into radio stations at, Sh at Shock or for Shock, 
um, and pitching music. I'd cross paths with all the other major labels and Sony had a, had a position going and they gave me a call in, in 2011 and, and said, listen, we need to fill the position pretty quickly. Would you be up for it? I'd, within two weeks, I, I was over at Sony. It was my dream job. And um, yeah, and then, and, and that, that sort of started off the, the next phase of my career, nearly, nearly uh, seven years, I think I worked in, in Melbourne, started out as promotions manager and then bit by bit just picked up roles along the way and, um, you know, just tried to, just tried to, to do over and above on every opportunity I could um, to the, to the point where, you know, I networked hard enough to, um, to be noticed by the, the, the team in Sydney, which is Sony's head office and, um, and moved up to Sydney to take, a, take the, the role of director of national promotion. So looking after the whole, national strategy for Sony Music's promotion. So that that's kind of just a, a bit of a snapshot. Happy to take any questions a bit about anything more in depth later, but just to sort of, I wanted to reiterate where, where it started. And, you know, over my time at Sony, I, you know, I loved getting interns in and I was pushed to let's get an intern in, let's get a work experience person because I know that's where it started for me. And um, you'd be amazed how many times like I'd speak to people and, uh, and they'd be great, you know, people, I don't even call them kids, it's too patronising. They'll be, they'll be good, you know, great people, but they'd say, oh, you know, I want to work at a major and that's it. And it, it's like, guys, there's, there's a few steps you've got to do before. You know, if some people can luck out and go straight to a major, great. But, yeah, I, I can't stress enough that, um, you know, you, you, you really need to be, have your eyes open. And we can talk about that um, a little bit more throughout the, throughout the chat. Uh, cool. So... I wanted to talk about how a label structure or major label, current major label structure, keeping in mind that everyone has its like nuances and they're slightly different. Labels love to call, you know, love to call departments different things just to you know, make them stand out apart from the other labels. But what, what I want to do, so I'll go through the departments I feel are, are relevant for job opportunities. Um, and not only just talk about the departments, but I want to go through um, what are the key attributes that people in those departments have? Because I know when I started out, I thought, oh yeah, I wanted to do, you know, publishing, but publishing, you need to be super analytical and you need to have a real lateral thinking, breadth of knowledge of music. And it didn't quite match up with what I like doing. So what I want to do is talk about some of the key attributes and then also, you know, a, a suggested a pathway. So, you know, if that is what you want to do and there are a few steps you need to take to get there, Hopefully I can you know, give you guys an idea of, of, of where you might want to go. So, um, yeah, let's start at the top. So a and uh, artist and repertoire, you, you would be amazed how many you know, people within a label don't know that a and actually stands for artist and repertoire. So as bad as that is, so, so the artists within the, the, the label and also you know, the repertoire that they make. Um, so what, you know, in, in essence, the, the A&R team are out there, they're scouting, they're out there scouting for talent. Once with they sign talent, they're also there um, nurturing, nurturing the, the talent and the music and getting it to a certain point. So it's not as a matter of just signing it and then that's it. You know, what, what, a, um, what an A&R manager would do is they would, um, you know, sign an artist and then they would start pairing them up, you know, the, with, with, uh, with certain songwriters or certain producers and work on like a, a style um, uh, th that they want to achieve with that particular artist. Um, so, so, you know, an, an A&R manager, let's say an A&R manager, and, and this, I can tell you without fail of all the, um, you know, the, the work experience and, uh, and interns we had, without fail, A&R was the number one thing everyone wanted to do. Um, Tough, you know, tough to get into, but not impossible. So you've got to have an ear for music, right? And, you got, and when I say ear for music, it, it's got to be all different types of music. And you've got to be able to, if you, if you don't necessarily like something, you still got to be able to, to hear or see um, why someone else might like it or, or why a particular um, yeah, a style of music resonates with a particular audience. So that's really key. Um, you, so you need to be very versatile. Um, I always thought if you could play music, it, it certainly built your credibility level within the artist community. You're dealing with artists, you're dealing with producers, you're telling them you like their stuff, you don't like their stuff, go back and do this. I feel like, you know, it's, I feel if you've got, got some kind of credibility on how you can play music and talk about music, that always helps. You, know, you do need marketing skills because when you're looking to sign an artist, you're often signing them quite raw. 
So you need to be able to identify that there's some talent there, but then project 12, 14, 36 months. Well, how am I going to get this person to that level and, um, and hit that audience? So um, marketing skills are definitely uh, key and also to deal with pressure because you're dealing with deadlines a lot of the time, you know, with, uh, with album deadlines and artists who want to go back and re-record this and re-record that. So, um, yeah, that's really key as well, being able to, to sort of, you know, work under, under deadlines. From, a, from a, a pathway point of view, I think if you're attending gigs, you know, that's that's definitely what, you know, it's a, it's a no-brainer. You've got to be out there. And, and then when you're attending gigs, it's trying to connect with people at the gigs and, you know, mates and fans and all that's good. But you know, when you go and say there's some of the smaller gigs, you can often go and have a beer or a, or, or a, or a Coke with, uh, with you know, the band manager or the band will come out after the set. And so it's about trying to build a strong network for yourself within the, the artist community, that's how you're gonna get respect and then that's gonna open a few doors. So so that's A&R. Um, a lot of people wanna to get to A&R and, and um, you know, it's certainly, there's jobs out there. There's the marketing department, which, you know, really is smack bang in the middle of, of a label. Um, everything pretty much goes through marketing when it comes to a release. You've got the promo team will go through it, the digital team will go through it, A&R will go through it. So marketing basically is like the quarterback of the record and the release. They'll, they'll be the ones that, you know, are responsible for pulling it all together and then getting it out to the public. So, um, so, so a marketing manager is what we call them at Sony or label managers at, at other places. Um, you know, a marketing qualification and skills helps. It's not the be all and end all, but it, you know, if, if you have got an ability to, to market in this modern age, especially with around digital marketing, it helps, but it's not everything. Um, you definitely got to be creative because you're dealing with creative people. You're dealing with artists that want to release an album and have it in their head, what they want it to look like and what they want it to sound like. So you need to be able to match it with these people. You need to have that creative flair and be able to take it to places that, that, that an artist wants to go to. Um, and you need to have good people skills uh, because you're dealing directly with managers. You're dealing with a lot of people within a label. So, you know, we, we, you just need to, uh, yeah, ha have that, be able to get the confidence of a, of a, of a manager or an artist that, yep, this person knows what they're doing with my record. So as far as getting into marketing, um, you know, band management. So if you, if you've been a band manager or you say you play in a band and you've taken over the role of manager within that band, um, that you do everything, you do everything within the band. You'll do the promo, you'll do the, you know, you do the marketing and you'll do the booking. And that's a, that's a good skill set. It's a good grounding to have because that's a marketer does do a bit of everything on the project. So I feel like that's a really good place to start. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, the, the, the qualification certainly doesn't, doesn't hurt. Okay. The digital department. Well, you know, without fail, I'm recently out of a label. This is like the hottest part of a label right now, the digital department and uh, are responsible for the account management of, of your digital service providers like uh, Apple and uh, Spotify and Amazon and, yeah, and more recently TikTok. So yeah, a lot of emphasis and resources are now starting to go within the digital um, team. Um, so a digital account manager, let's say that's that's quite a typical role within within a digital team at a label. You need to be really analytical. Um, and, and it's a it's a real fine balance that that um, labels are having at the moment between sheer gut instinct on things and also using this incredible amount of rich data that they're getting out of the likes of Spotify. They don't so much get it out of Apple. Apple a little bit more gated, but um, you know you can you can dive into some of real granular stuff when it comes to. The, the data you're getting out of Spotify, like who's listening, what time they're listening, what part of the song they're skipping on. Like, it's really kind of crazy. Um, so you, know, you need to have a really analytical brain when you're looking at some of those figures. Um, you've got to be fast paced because you're basically in the department of releasing records. So, you know, and, and, and getting it to the shop, so to speak. Like, it's not so much about getting it out you know, to, to JB Hi-Fi and pressing it. Like if, if an artist wants to release a song in a couple of days, well, that's, there's a bit of back-end work that goes in to getting it up on a DSP. So you've got to be really fast-paced and ready to work at a speed of, a, of an artist. Um, you know, similar to, to, to most, you know, jobs within a relationship, in a, um, 
label. You need to be able to build strong relationships, and that's with your with your accounts. So you know you you, you want to really have Spotify, Apple, all those guys really respecting your knowledge of music and 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 your advice that you give them. And like yeah, the broad knowledge is go, goes without saying. You just got to be able to. Um, yeah, you got to be able to appreciate all types of music, not like it, but appreciate it. So the pathway, um, yeah, it's an interesting one, the pathway with this when I was looking, I was thinking about it um, because I haven't really got my finger on, I haven't really noticed a real trend of, yeah, okay, all the, all the digital account managers that I've, I've worked with, they've done this or they've done that. The, the closest thing I got was they've always been within the label already. So, um, you know, so basically my suggestion is getting any role at a record company. And that doesn't necessarily mean something specific to, to um, digital. Like, I, you know, if you can be a receptionist at a record company, you're in the door at a record company. Like if you can be a, you know, I'm not going to talk about legal, but like paralegal is just the boring, the boring legal job. You don't need to be qualified for it. It's a, you know, a lot of you know admin, but if you can get yourself in the door at a record company, I think that can get you on your path to get to a digital account manager role. So, um, so, so that's kind of what I've landed on. Um, also working for one of the DSPs is huge as well, because you'll build relationships there. So if you come out of say a junior role at a, at a Spotify or Apple, that's also going to hold you in good stead. Okay, a couple more to go, guys. Just um, so licensing, licensing was a is a really lucrative department within within a label, um, and, and it's getting increasingly more popular. Um, it's certainly from a resources point of view. In my time at Sony, I saw it sort of go through the roof because you could see the, the the revenue that could be generated in say getting a um you know getting a song like george ezra shotgun on a commonwealth bank ad like that that was huge you know it's a huge twofold you get you know the money generated out of licensing and you also get the promotional aspect of that as well so a licensing coordinator or manager typical role in, in a licensing department okay you gotta have great ear for music and have a great ear, um, music knowledge that's coupled with being a lateral thinker. So, you know, you, you, lyrics, like you need to have a really great understanding. Oh, that, that song, that lyric might fit with that campaign that's being pitched to us. Or, um, you know, there, there's like so many times I know that, that, that the licensing department would, you know, secure a, 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 a sink, what we call a sink. And um, you'd just be like, how did you think about that? Like, what, you know, they, they, you just got to have a real rich knowledge and a, and a way to be able to connect that with, uh, you know, with circumstances that are in front of you. Um, you've got to be good with numbers, which rules me out straight away, but um, you've got to be good with numbers because there's often a lot of negotiation involved in the splits on how much you're going to charge for, um, for the use of that music. So, you know, the, the negotiation will definitely come around, you know, how big is the, is the artist? Um, how big is the, the company that you're dealing with? That, that off, often has a bit of pull. So, um, yeah, there's a lot of different scenarios. But, you know, the licensing department, you know, is a, is a really interesting one within a label. Um, and similar, you know, similar to, um, to, to with uh, the digital team, just getting your foot in the door, I think, is the best way to try and get within licensing. Or alternatively, working for... Um, a publisher. So, you know, Sony's a label, but then Sony's got the ATV publishing and Universal's a label, but they've got publishing. So two very different things, label and publishing. So working within a publisher. Um, and of course, you've got the collection societies as well, like your APRAs and AMCOS, PPCA, you know, they're collecting royalties for songwriters. That, that Those skill sets are very much aligned to what we're doing in, in licensing as well. Um, so, yeah, so lastly, um, Publicity and promotion. I'll get right into promotion later because that's sort of what I did. What I did, and, uh, and and I can really go quite in detail on that. But publicity and promotion. Um, let's just pick out the, the role of a publicist. All right. So that's separating a publicist and promo. Um, so that's someone that you know they'll be in charge of of, of an artist's entire schedule. So you know any interviews they're doing, communications with management. Um, you know, releasing, writing and releasing, you know, press releases or updates on an artist. So with that being the skills that you need, you definitely need to have a, a really good attention to detail. Um, uh, no mistakes on those PRs used to drive us absolutely crazy and media crazy. Um, elite writing skills for obvious reasons when you're, you know, you're writing up press releases. 
you definitely got to work under pressure because, you know, if something huge happens and you win an ARIA or you win a Grammy or whatever that might be, you know, you got to work quick and get word out um, really fast to the, to the you know, media, more so than ever now. Um, and you've you got to be great with people. You definitely have to be great with people. Um, so as far as a, a pathway goes, um, getting your foot in the door, it's a recurring theme, but any, you know, if you can turn at a record company and work at a record company, it's definitely a good way to sort of get yourself you know, within the, the ecosystem of a label. Um, and then on top of that, you know, you've got publicists that work for labels. You've also got a stack of independent and, and, and external publicists, what we call them. Um, so they work for themselves and contract out to labels. They're getting used more and more these days. Um, a lot easier to say, go to an external publicist and say, hey, I'll do you know two, three, four weeks for you just to get a vibe on what it is. Um, then it would be to do it at a label. They'll absolutely relish that opportunity to have someone help them because independent publicist works like ridiculous hours. So um, so that, that that's a good way, yeah. You know? And also, you know, from a, from a, you know, a writing skills point of view, having a communications journalist type degree certainly doesn't uh, doesn't harm your chances. So, so, so guys, uh, for me, they're like the key departments within a label that I I would assume that you know, being in the course that you're in, that this um, you know the, these are areas of a business that you would be you know, interested in working in. So I hope you know, apart from saying yeah, great, these are the these are the departments. I hope this. Um, Gives you a bit of an idea of sort of whether you've got the right skill set for it, and and as, you know, a way you might be able to kind of work yourself in there. Um, so, Amy, um, I've been chatting for a bit. Did you did you want to see if there's any any questions? Um, yeah, no, thank you so much for that intro. Um, we have one question. Um, I'll just throw it to you. Um, sure. How does one get in contact with a promo team for a digital distribution release? Um, so, our person asking the question has. Uh, is doing their own promo, but can't seem to break through the barrier. Yeah, so uh, so just to just to clarify that, uh, uh, the, maybe whoever asked the question could jump on. But um, is it um, are, are they trying to to contract like an external publicist to get to, to help them help? Is that is that what what the the goal is? Um, Yui, if you're in the do you want to just unmute your mic and have a chat? Um, we might move to the next question. Yeah, sure. Um, oh, I can, we'll, I can get we'll, it back. We'll save the, um, that, yeah, we'll save that. Yeah. Um, so you will save that for the end. Um, so we can have a bit more of a chat about that. Yeah, um, sure. George has got a bit of a broader question um, in terms of departments within the label. Um, mm -hmm. Is there a place for a producer or audio engineer to work with you? You know what? What was the name of the person who asked it? Jordan. Um, I actually, I actually had a few more um, departments in my first sort of incarnation of this deck. I had legal in there, and I had you know production and audio in there. But in the, in the interest of having to sort of condense it a little bit, I took that out. The short answer to the question is yes, yes, there is. It's it's quite small. Um, speaking from my experience within. The Sony, um, you know, family. Uh, Sony have their own studio, and I know Universal do as well. That's based in Sydney, um, and they do have a an engineer that's that's employed um, full time. Um, Adrian Bearspeak, his name is. He produced the um, the Gang of Youth's first record, and he's he's really highly regarded within the industry. So, um, it, yes, there are there are. Um, uh, some limited job opportunities in, in production and audio engineering that are in-house within the label. But then, of course, there's always those opportunities to, say, work with artists and and A&R teams, um, so to say, to contract out rather than actually be in-house. So, um, yeah, quickest way to answer it is, yeah, a couple of limited um, opportunities because the two majors, Universal and uh, UMA, have um, studios. Um, but yeah, there's also opportunities to, to contract out to them. Okay. So a few more questions have come in. I'm just going to, um, there's a couple that I think will be better suited to the end. So, yeah, sure. um, just with, um, Jake Folden, um, your question there and Mark's, um, they're both kind of, uh, strategy questions for artists. Um, so could you both hang on to the end and we'll get back to them, but uh, just a broader question from Jared, um, asking how much of a royalty split does a label take? 
Jared, to, to be perfectly honest with you, I, 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 I'd be guessing. Um, it, it's, there's, no, there's no set answer to that. It very much depends on the deal that's done. And I'll, I'll like broadly touch on that a little bit later about how the modern day label are doing deals. And it, every single deal is different now. There's no like set kind of uh, like fee. If I, I don't have the figures because honestly in promo, which is what I did, um, that that royalty side of things was very much a domain of business affairs and and I'd be absolutely guessing. Um, however, what I can tell you is that the split on, on for instance, say a Tones and I record that's licensed to Sony would be very much different to the split on say a Guy Sebastian record, um, which are who, you know, acted the direct signing. So Sony are, there's a lot more outlay going through say a Guy Sebastian record because they're paying for the recording and they're paying for the promo and they're paying for the marketing versus what you would get if you're licensing out, like for instance, Tones and I, like for instance, Old Town Road, Little Nas X track, like there's very different deals that are out there. So, Short answer, can't, can't answer that one, but it's, yeah, it, it varies from artist to artist depending on what deal you cut. Okay, great. Um, do you want to maybe yeah. keep moving on? Um, sure. Yeah, so we'll come back to a couple of these questions at the end, but um, yeah, we'll just, we'll move on to the next section now. Thanks. Yeah. Yep, sounds good. So, um, pro promotions, promo, that's that's my wheelhouse, guys. That's, I'm, I'm happy to talk about as much as I can the label holistically, but um, but this stuff I can, you know, talk about with a lot of, uh, a lot of confidence and expertise. Um, so, what, what is promo? So, promo, um, promotions within a record company, in the, and, and the definition of promo within a record company is quite different to what, promotions might be out in the shops like I was at the shops the other day and there was something that was selling like the half price deal it was a promo right but but that's just a price reduction and, and that that's called a promotion in the sales world that's called a promotion promotion in in the record company world is a little different so what I want to do is I want to give you that as a sort of starting point and then take you through like some specific examples of what promo is and a week in the life of a promo manager um, they're all they're all different, but you know we'll, we'll we'll try and cover off and give you a bit of an idea. Um, so I've actually I wrote this down because I, I feel like I didn't want to fudge this uh, this definition. But in my mind, over the years, I've kind of formulated it to this, which is the process of getting exposure for your artist, song, record, release, video, whatever it is, by using the strength of your relationships, creativity, and sales now to influence a decision maker to promote your content, all right? A bit wordy, all right? But what it basically we're saying is, is that you have to use your relationships to get the result. You can't use a direct, uh, a direct uh, fee. So simply put, a promotions team, we don't pay for placement. You can't pay to get a song on the radio. Uh, that's payola and that was outlawed in the 1950s and caused a massive drama in the US. You can't, you can't pay to get an artist interviewed on breakfast radio in the morning. You, that, that's not how that system works. That's marketing. If you want to, you want to pay, if you want to put money down and pay for a certain placement within a radio station, within a TV show, within a magazine, within a blog, that's marketing. Promotions is just using the relationships you got to get your stuff promoted. So, you know, I'd always argue with the marketing team, we got the harder job, but that's up for debate. Um, so, some real world examples, okay? So hopefully this kind of ties it all in a bit better. So the number one, you know, when you, when you talk promo within a record company, you think convincing a radio programmer to add a song to a radio playlist, all right? There's a lot of different facets to, to promo, but the, at, the, at the center of it all, getting radio play is what the, 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 the essential job of a, of, a, um, of a promotions manager is. And they do that by going in and meeting with a programmer. Now, for those who don't know that like jocks on radio, they don't get to choose slightly triple J aside, but we can get into that later, but say commercial radio, they don't get to choose what songs they play. That's all goes through a specific team within a radio station that look at data. They look at analytics. They go through a whole bunch of things. They listen to radio record company people and then decide what they're going to play. So that is a, you know, an absolute um, key element of a promo person. All right, pitching in an interview for a drive radio producer to get an artist interviewed. So let's say Kate, Tim and Marty, you want to get, you know, you want to get 
Delta Goodrum on the radio, that goes through a pitching process where you would pitch it into a producer. You've got, you know, tens and tens and tens of pitches going through to producers every day, whether it's a movie or whether it's a, a TV show, whether it's someone selling something, whatever it might be, you've got to compete for that spot. And that, you know, is the, the job of the promotions person to make a compelling pitch and have a relationship with the producer that, you know, if, if they'll believe you that this is going to be good content for them. You know, securing a live TV performance, breakfast, you know, wherever you see Sunrise, I saw uh, Daryl Braithwaite the other day, that's promo, that's going in, meeting, that's not paid for, that's that's having a hustle and have a relationship with the, you know, the, the morning's producer. Booking an artist on like a version, that, that, that's, a, that's always a tough one, right? Because Triple J are always wanting to get a little bit out of it themselves and, and it might be, hey, if you want to do your hit, then you'll need to do the, the like a version for us. Um, so that's always a bit of back and forth. Again, relationships, it comes down to, you know. So this is slightly different. Negotiating um, with a radio station for an artist to play a listener event. So let me set, a, set the picture. Let's say that that breakfast radio, let's pull Fox FM. I'm based in Melbourne. So let's say Fox FM want to have a singles party, all right? And they say, we want a, we want an artist to perform. So we go through, who's got a song out? All right, Illy. Let's say Illy, he's got a brand new song out. Great for their demographic. Right, we'll put Illy on your, your singles party and, and Illy will play three songs and great, but we need some commitment on the radio airplay. So he's got a new single out, we need to make now that this is good. So that's the kind of you know negotiation you do around something like that. Promo, no money's exchanged hands. It's just using relationships, using the content you've got uh, to get the outcome. You know, the last one I'll go through, you know, radio pr promotion. So set the picture it's a night show okay so you've got an up-and-coming artist you know younger skewed you know younger skewed and um uh, fan base so we talk to we'll pull nova let's say nova on this one um smallsy's smallsy's surgery right smallsy's surgery you've got a heap of young listeners um what we'll do is we'll we've got um harry styles harry styles is playing a concert in la we've got a brand new harry styles album we're trying to sell it We'll give you two tickets, concert in LA, flights, send two listeners over. We need a week's worth of promotion. Every night on the show, you're going to talk about Harry Styles, you're going to play the song, we're going to get album credit. Boom, that's that's a radio promotion. So again, yes, th there's a financial investment involved, but you're not just giving over money, all right? You've got to be a bit more creative with it. So that, those, what, three, six examples are what, you know, a day-to-day -day sort of promo person does. That's bread and butter promo. Um, so, okay, so what I'll do, let's try and go through a week. I'll do it really quickly. Um, and as I was putting this together, the, the, the beauty of the beauty of, of a promo manager or being in promotions is that, that no two weeks are ever the same. And that, that sounds like a cliche, right? And, and no two weeks aren't the same for many people, but the difference between one week to the next within a promo role can be huge. Like it can be absolutely huge. You'll have different music to talk about. You'll have different artists you're working with. You'll have different uh, media that you're spending more time with. You know, you'll have different pitches to put. It, it, it just varies so much. So let me just quickly go through what, you know, may, maybe what a, what a seven days might look like. So Monday and Tuesday are always focused around getting radio audition. If you're a promo person, you're talking commercial radio auditions, you might be talking Triple J, you might be talking, you know, adult radio, so pardon me, ABC, local, whatever it might be. Um, and why Monday and Tuesday are those days is that all music playlists need to be finalized for the week by Wednesday and submitted. So then they're updated through their system. So Monday and Tuesday are the real heavy days where you're taking meetings with radio um, uh, music directors. You're doing a bulk of your research. So you're researching tracks. So what does that mean? If I'm gonna go in and talk to a music director about the song, uh, you, need, you need to have your facts. So where is it on, on the local charts? Where is it on the international charts? What story does it have coming out of, if it's an international track? You know, have they performed on Fallon recently? Or, you know, what's their history with the station? Maybe their last release was like a number one airplay song for the station. You go through and you've got to mine all these little bits of facts and data that, that are going to help you convince that person that this song should be on their radio station. Because right? they're probably getting 25 song, new songs a week getting pitched at them, right? So you're putting in a heap of research. And now with the amount of the, the, 
data we're getting from, from streaming and digital, you, you are spending a lot of time on that. Um, you meet with the music directors, you, you have those conversations. You, know, you could be, you could be planning a radio stunt. You could be thinking, right, we've got this, uh, we've got this song uh, called, called Ice Cream, right? So what are we going to do? Um, how are we going to maybe, you know, punch this through the other 25 songs? that are going to get presented well maybe we get like specially made ice creams with the you know packets with the artist name on whatever that might be a start just to kind of cut through the, the clutter and noise and 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 have fun because that's a lot, lot to do with what a promo person does so that might be your monday tuesday wednesday as you start to see your, your additions come through whether the song's been added on the radio or not you know you're looking at at the data so you, you're looking at the spit that um spins data so We've got systems that tell you every song a radio station's played at what time of the day they played it. Um, it's really sort of granular stuff. So, you, you know, the more information you know about a station, the more credibility you have when you go in there uh, to talk to them and tell them, hey, this should be on your station. They come back and you say, well, you don't even know what's on our station. So it's really important. Know what a station's playing, know what a station stands for, know what their demographics are. Um, really important to have that. If you've got additions, great. You send them out to the company and you get the taps on the back and everyone says, well done. If you don't, if you, you, know, you had a, a big song you thought was going to get played but it's not, then it's about trying to get that feedback and go, right, okay, music director, I understand you're not playing it. It's disappointing. I reckon you should, but why? What's the feedback? Why hasn't it got played? What can I do for you? Um, getting that sometimes can be tricky but that's a relationship thing. Then the fun part, reporting it back into the business and telling uh, and telling. You know, the marketing manager, listen, the song's not going to get played or this is why they don't think it's any good or there's a bed, there's a song from Universal, which is better, whatever it might be. Key part of being a promo person, reporting that back into the business. And then how hey, you might have to juggle um, a, an interview schedule that's coming next week for an Australian artist that's about to uh, do the rounds of promo. So then you get your pitches out. You email the producers, call the producers, say, well, we've got, you know, Tones and I coming into town next week, you know, love to get her on the breakfast show, etc." So that's taking us to Wednesday. Thursday, I always like Thursdays, slightly less sort of crazy and probably of all the days within the week as a promo person, a chance to breathe. Um, but on occasions, let's say we've got this brand new uh, Australian artist we've signed. But for argument's sake, let's call, call her Alpha. All right, so Alpha's uh, just been signed to the label. No one knows anything about her. Incredible acoustic artist. So seeing her live is a must. What a promo person would do, get off the phone, all the radio stations, relevant radio stations within um, the state, let's say Victoria. Hey, got this awesome artist. Want to you know, do something for your staff? Uh, we'll bring her in. She can do a couple of acoustic songs. We'll buy you guys pizzas. We'll buy you lunch, whatever it might be. Just make it, give the staff a reason to what, you know, outside of the performance, give the staff a reason to come. Um, and, and then you go around with that artist and you start trying to build their network a little bit. You connect them with the, you know, the music director and you connect them with the sales, but you connect them with the station so that when it comes time to really sort of get the support of the station, um, the people around know, oh, yeah, that's right. Maybe you came in and did that acoustic performance for us. Yeah, that was awesome. Yeah, I think we should support this. So, you know, the, the, it's important to, to be getting, apart from pitching in music, which is recorded and, you know, superstar acts or big Australian artists, you also need to start a process for emerging acts as well. Um, and that could be done by, by that method. Uh, so Friday, let's say Friday, we've got a big international touring. We've got a concert in Melbourne on the Saturday night. Friday, uh, we've got to take them in to Breakfast Radio. Uh, well, so Friday, we've got to take them around Melbourne to get them to do interviews. So we line them up. All right, what's going to give us the biggest exposure? Well, Breakfast Radio, most listeners, no doubt. Right, Drive, well, that's a national show. So that's a great audience too. Let's do Drive. You go in, you pick the, you know, the big looks. Um, you'll be like physically there taking the artist around. It's called artist relations. So you know, definitely have to build a good rapport with the artist. You introduce the artist to the media outlet, take a heap of photos for them, whatever it might be. Um, but that, they're always pretty taxing days. They're always on, on an edge when you've got an international on, on tap. More often than not, they go well. You get to Saturday. You've probably got a gig. You've probably got a gig if it's not, if it's not a Sony gig um, or, sorry, if it's not a gig for your uh, company, uh, it may be a gig you just want to go and see because uh, apart from working you know, in music, we love it as well. So you might want to go and do that. 
Um, Sunday, same thing applies. Might be a gig you want to check out. Might be a bit of work, whatever it is. And then also, if you're really prepared, you would then start trying to get all your, your facts and figures ready for your next uh, round of music, which comes around on Monday. So depending, if you like an early start on a Monday, you can do it on Monday morning, but you can be prepared. So that, guys, is, is a, a an example of a week um, of what it might look like going, uh, yeah, working working as a promo manager at a major record label. Um, really cool. As you can tell, some awesome stuff. There's pressures in there, but... You know, I, I, as you can see, I can tell why a lot of people want to, you know, want to do this for a, for a profession. Um, cool. So let me, so there's a lot, heaps of promo managers out there. Being a promo manager or working in promotions, I'll tell you now, is absolutely not rocket science, all right? There's no rocket science to it. Um, but what I would say is there's definitely a certain skill set that promo people have. Um and it doesn't come naturally to everyone. And I, and I learned this over, over the years, just sort of doing what, what, what I do and I'm watching my colleagues do it and thinking, all right, well, that's just what we do. But it, you know, other people would look in and go, oh, well, you know, that, that seems like it's you know, difficult. So you need, a, you need a passion and a knowledge for music, all right? Because you, you, if you're, it's a sales job. I always used to say, promo is a sales job. You're selling, you're selling a product to, to someone and you want them to take it on and, and promote it for you. You need to be passionate about that process, all right? You need to be passionate. That being said, you don't like every you don't like every song you ever take to radio, like that's that or or, or pitching to wherever you're pitching it. I keep saying radio, but yeah, you don't like everything. But I mentioned it earlier with A and R. You still need to be able to find the 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 element in that music that you know connects with someone else. Now, for instance. Fox FM is a commercial radio station that's aimed at, um, say, uh, females between 30, 35 is their bullseye, right? So I'm, I'm 35, but I'm male. So I, they're, they're trying to program music for, for not necessarily for me. So if I'm going into selling, I need to be able to find if it's a, you know, if it's a Selena Gomez song or if it's a Ariana Grande. No, that's not what I love, but I know that, the Fox FM audience love it. And that's how you can sort of get yourself in that mindset and be able to sell that. So it's a passion and a knowledge of music that I think, you know, is the, is the starting point. The next three are grouped together because I think they're all kind of one in the same. Great interpersonal skills, ability to form rela genuine relationships and trustworthy. And that comes from when you are going in on a week in week out basis and you're asking someone to do something for you, you know, or give you something being promotion and exposure, you need to have credibility going in there and to form that relationship where, Hey, you can't go in and say every song's a hit because you know, that's not the case. So when you do say one's a hit, you, it's the boy who cried wolf. So being able to, 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 to form a genuine relationship with the music director, which extends beyond work. It, it's, it's knowing their, you know, their family or their, you know, we, we think things that they're interested in or, or all the little finer details, their birthdays, all those things that make it a genuine relationship and not just a transactional, I'm coming in, I know you want a song from me, you know I want an addition from you, let's go. You need to build something a lot deeper than that. That's what the successful promotion the managers have. You know, there are a lot of promo managers that, that are good, but if you're talking about the ones that are a cut above, it's a it's a someone who can build a genuine relationship and get trust straight away. Um, creativity is a really big part of it because what I mentioned earlier, maybe 25, maybe 30 new songs a week. Like there's a lot of good music that gets serviced to radio stations. There is a very, very small amount of space that they've got on their playlist to play it or on their shows to feature artists. So what can you do to, um, you know, uh, differentiate yourself from your competitors is super, super important. Um, you know, that, that confidence and, and being outgoing um, is again, successful promo manager versus normal promo manager. You're out a lot. And if you don't like going out a lot, well then it's probably not, you know, not, not your, you know, your, um, you know, bullseye. Um, and when you're out, it's one thing going out, but it's also making it useful. So connecting with people. So if you're at a radio station event, you know, connecting with the, the right people. If you're at a gig and a, you've got an international manager in town who manages like three or four other big artists, like 
connect with those people and build a relationship. So you need to be up for going out a lot. You need to be able to sort of make use of it. And then on, on the flip side of that, you need to be like, have, have what I used to call have gears like in a car, have gears to go through. So you can be the crazy, you know, creative one that dresses up in a clown suit to go to radio to get a song on. You can be that confident, outgoing person that's uh, that's going to, to to connect with a manager at a gig. And then you've got to be that sort of professional person when you've got an artist with you and you've got to um, connect them with media and you've got to sort of change gears and sort of go into a different mindset. Again, successful promo managers have gears that can, sort of adapt to any situation. So, you know, like I said, certainly, you know, degrees and all that kind of thing for me, not, it's, it's, I don't think my degree sort of got me where I am. It, it might have helped against another person, but if you've got these sort of uh, qualities and skill sets, I think that's going to, that's going to be what sets you apart as a, as a promo manager. Um, so, guys, I'm talking a lot about radio um, I, because, as I mentioned, promo, um, the bedrock of promotions and in a record company mindset, radio is very much a part of that. So, you know what, with the way uh, digital is sort of com coming like a freight train or has already come and the impact it's having on, on, the, the, on labels at the moment, I, I, this is a relevant question, right? This is, and I'm, I thought this may be us, so I preempted it. Um, is a promotions team still relevant in a in a modern day record company? Um, fair question. He, here's my take on it. Absolutely, yes, yes, it is, um, and I think that's evidenced by the fact that I think all three major labels in the last six months have all added headcount to their promotions team. So that, for me, number one is uh, is pretty clear. But a couple of quick points. Let me let me just tell you why I think that and why I don't think I'm being biased. The music industry like has a history of being like a back to the future type of industry. And what I mean by that is this, this, this fundamentals within the music industry that may evolve and change over time, but they always seem to sort of come back. And a couple of examples that I just thought of today, um, you got um, music styles. So music styles is a really easy one. The way that they evolve, the way that say sounds from the seventies pop back up and become a moment, and then sounds from the eight. But that is a very much a fashion thing. It's a music thing. It's a trend thing. Um, yeah, music industry has done that forever. You've got things like uh, recording studios. You know, for, for decades, you know, brick, bricks and mortar recording studios were it. You know, going recording studio. Then you had a decade, decade and a half where all that technology was a fraction of the price. You could put it in your bedroom and you could do, you could make a record. In the last two years, I can tell you, it has flipped back the other way and all the major record companies are investing heavily, again, in studios that they actually got rid of to put them back in because artists, up and coming artists, they want that, they want that option. They want to be able to go in a studio, go into a creative space, get out of their sort of room and, and feel like that old school music industry. So that's another one. You look at vinyl. You know, vinyl, obvious resurgence. Gone, came back, cool again, I like vinyl. Lastly, the one I thought about was the headphones, right? You had your headphones when everyone had a Walkman and a Discman, had the headphones on, went through the period, the white earbuds, iPods, wouldn't be caught dead wearing, uh, wouldn't be caught dead wearing the big headphones. And the obvious swing back now with, uh, with Beats and, you know, it feels like that's more common to have the big headphones with the good sound quality. So, with all that being said, I think that radio, you're talking about fundamentals, radio has been around and been the driver of discovery of music for so long. And I think, yes, absolutely, you can't discount streaming. Um, it's changed people's habits, the way they go to New Music Friday and the like to find, um, you know, what's next and, and discover it. Absolutely. But, you know, when you're talking about sort of taking a song from uh, discovery level to uh, the, the the mega hit that I hear it in a, in a supermarket. The mum knows it. Selling out five Rod Laver arenas in 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 Melbourne, superstar level. Radio still has a, a real big big um, part to play in that. Um, there's a couple of other you know points I've got there. Just for the instance of time, I'll probably keep rolling along. But if anyone wants to kind of touch back on this in the in the Q and A, happy to um happy to to, to cover that off. So 
Uh, lastly, this is, this is my last little bit on promo. I just want to uh, talk about um, kind of why I feel, let's succinctly put why I feel it's still got a, a place. So, so mainstream media, specifically radio, still has an important role in breaking artists, um, getting to the media level, like I mentioned. Um, that case, the need for promo professionals, it's absolutely still around and still going to be integral part of the business. Um, I, I, I personally, I'm not being biased, but I'm happy to you know, take any questions on it. Um, uh, I, I love talking about promo. I think it's such an important part of a, a record label and, and certainly like the heart, so when, from a Sony point of view, it's the heartbeat of the label. They're always the crazy ones. They're always the one bringing the energy. They're always the ones celebrating the wins. They're always the one picking everyone up when there's a low morale. Um, really important part of the, um, of the business. Uh, Amy, um, just wanted to, to check in, make sure people aren't, uh, aren't falling asleep and if there's anything uh, I can answer. Yeah, that's a really good um, time to take a little, uh, take a little breather. Um, so it's five o'clock. Um, I've got a couple of questions. Um, one, which I think is interesting, you've you kind of touched on it, but um, we had someone ask, um, how do you typically discover an artist? How would a label typically discover an artist? Yeah, yeah, good question. Um, variety of ways. Uh, believe it or not, and you think, oh, it's because it's a major label, you don't do it this way. But th there are people within you know, labels that that scour. They scour YouTube's. They scour. You know, we, we generally at the at the more entry level um, uh, part of, of of the department. But you know, they'll they'll look at um, they'll look at YouTube's. They'll uh, YouTube channels. They'll look at Spotify. I mean. Spotify and Apple now, yes, definitely, they're, they're trailing those. Um, using contacts that um, producers, you know, tips that producers might have. So a lot of producers out there are working with artists in an early stage. And, you know, as an A&R department builds relationships, you know, with certain producers out there, they might get the, hey, check out this demo. There's the old-fashioned way of just sending stuff in. Um, you know, I, I, yeah, without going into the nitty-gritty, you know, people out there probably know the kid Leroy that, that literally was the kid Leroy I think it was his mum sending in a demo like that's so old school sent it through to someone at Sony and and away we went um the Tones and I example I can tell you that's a funny one um you know one of my colleagues was on a holiday in Byron um and she was yeah you know, the, the you know um, famous story of Tones and I busking in Byron well one of our colleagues in in wasn't even in A&R she worked in promo and uh, came back and said, hey, there's this incredible artist I've seen. Like, th this show was nuts. She's playing a show in Sydney in two days. Like, can I fly up from Melbourne and go to it? Like, I think there's something here. And the rest is history with what happened with Tone. So, um, you know, what have I gone through? I've gone through there's the old school way demos. There's going out to gigs and seeing artists 100%. We've got people that go out, watch gigs, see and perform live is really key. Uh, there's trailing, trailing um, digital, uh, and there's yeah, and, and there's uh, tip-offs from from managers and and producers. Yeah, great. That's that's a awesome answer. Um, I I guess there was another side to that is what would you look for when signing an artist? I know this isn't promotions, but I thought it was a, a fun question to ask. Yeah, no, it, it is, and I'm more, more than happy because we'd often promotion team would often get sort of brought in at, at certain levels to, to say, hey, um, it, it, it kind of straddles two things with A&R. There's the creative, there's the, the artist integrity and the, and the quality of the work side of it. And then there is the commerciality of it. So um, particularly at a major label, it's, it's a fine, it's a real fine balance because Every now and again, like a super unusual act might get signed to the label because it has benefits of that artist being on the label. It's a credibility thing. Like, gee, Sony had signed that artist. You know, everyone thinks Sony's mainstream. They might go down that path, but more often than not, we'll look at an artist, go, right, what are the music trends at the moment? So there's right now, you're unlikely to see like a four-piece. Uh, and, and please remember, I'm not at Sony anymore, so I'm not speaking on behalf of Sony. But you're... you're Unusual, unlikely to see a four-piece rock band right now get a massive deal because what's what's getting played and what's getting streamed at the moment isn't necessarily rock music. So what an A&R team's looking to do is look at current trends, definitely look at future trends. So what 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 is coming? Because by the time you sign an artist, develop the artist, record the artist, there's a big period of time that goes. So you want to try and see what trends are coming and then look at 
well, what's the what's the, the, the viability of this to, to, to make it a commercial product? Um, make some money out of it, to be honest. But that's that's some of the thought process behind it. So looking for, for gaps in your roster to fill and going, right, can we get this to a point where we're gonna we're gonna be able to make make this artist a star? Mm. Um, now awesome. I've got uh, another one, which you'd probably be well across. Um, do radio stations have a percentage required of them to play new and upcoming artists? Yes. And I'll talk about this. Um, I'll talk about this a, a little bit later really quickly, but the short answer is yes, they do. They have a 25%. Well, it's sorry. It depends on what uh, the classification of the radio station is. So for instance, gold here in Melbourne they're not classified as a new music hit station. So their quota, I believe, sits around 15%. So 15% of their music played between 6 a.m. and 12 p.m. needs to be Australian music, all right? Um, a hit music station, which Nova's classified as and which Fox FM um, is classified as, or Today FM, um, which they are ropeable about today because they feel they've changed their format, but they are still classified as a hit music station. They need to pay 25%. So 25% Australian doesn't necessarily have to be new music. And that's, there's a lot of pressure on this at the moment, a lot of pressure. Um, but 25, 25% on a new music station has to be Aussie between six and 12. And Can how that well, it stations get around that is they do a new music night show, pardon me, mm -hmm. between 10 and 12 PM and, stack that full of Aussie music and try and get, get around it. But it's certainly a very um, hot topic within ARIA at the moment and, mm -hmm. uh, and watch this space, I reckon. I want to ask, like, you're obviously a big advocate of Australian music. Like, how do you personally feel about that quota? Oh, uh, yeah. I, it's, it's, if it was um, policed uh, as stringently as it should, Amy, I think that's a good start. Um, it, it's a balance and, and I, I kind of see uh, the radio industry side of things like where well, their argument is, well, we're, we're a business, you know, we just can't play stuff that's not popular just to yeah. fill a quota. Um, that being said, that being said, um, I think that that 25% is a very reasonable quota for a hit music station. And I actually think, Amy, it should be brought down from... 6 till 12 p.m., um, or sorry, a.m., um, bring it down to, to, to maybe 8. Um, so so the, the other thing that they tightened up, so going back about 18 months, I think it was, um, Sia, so Sia would write a song. Sia would be classified as Australian content, believe it or not, because uh, she's Australian and she wrote the song. So... Um, all of the big hits that like Katy Perry released and Gaga or whoever it was, the, all these songs were getting getting classified. Or if, or if one Australian guitarist played on the record, that would be classified. Now, s since that time, and, and there's been some scrutiny on some of the um, criteria, that's been really top, like shrunk. So now it's got to be like 50% of the performing artist has to be Australian. Um, for it to classify as Australian content. New Zealanders are now not classified as Australian content. Uh, I know when Lord was like the thing, mm. uh, that would drive us crazy because radio would get their uh, content up by, by playing a lot of Lord and, and it wasn't helping Aussie artists. So um, I think I can tell everyone from my experiences, there's been some really great strides made and, and radio aren't, you know, they're not being mischievous about it i think they, they they may have been in the past but they're coming along for the ride and i reckon watch this space i think in the next 12 months or so you'll see a lot of great support for, for aussie artists on the radio great um i have another question this is actually for me personally but do you want to move on it's it's about more COVID 19 environment um I'm not yeah, let, let me move on, uh, Amy, because I do, I, I want to cover off something about COVID-19. Um, so knowing that it's five o'clock and as I expected, I, I've kind of chatted and chatted and chatted. So I'll kind of power through the back half of this. It's only about awesome. six, six more slides or so. So, um, but I will definitely cover off on, on some COVID stuff. Nice. All right. We'll keep going. Cool, guys. So um, what, what I want to do now is, is talk about, um, you know, there's no promo. I've, I've waffled on about promo, but there's no promo unless you've actually got a record to promote, right? So I thought it'd be really interesting um, to talk to, to you guys about how a modern day record 
um, label, major record label releases a song, you know, that, that step-by-step -step process, something we take for granted, but hopefully, you know, maybe you guys uh, can take something out of it and learn something and, and have some questions. Now, what I want to do is quickly compare how it works with an Aussie release versus an international, because they are quite different. Um, so let me just sort of power through this. So an A&R um, sign an artist, all right? And, and, and once it's signed, they'll develop the stylistic direction. Now, there's, there's different periods. Like you can sign an artist that is super raw and you just go, right, this is a blank canvas that well, I've heard a demo we're going to work with them, put them on ice for a year, two years, and develop this artist. There's others that come, the songs are done, the, the style is done, the artist knows exactly what we want, and, and Tones is a good example. So, there's, so, so that's that stylistic direction, that's done, that's ready to go. Um, number two, so that you got, so you know, the songs are written, so whether that be with the help of AR, pairing them up with songwriters, pairing them up with producers, or if they've come to the label with the songs already done. That's the next process, getting the music to the point, depending on the deal, are we doing a single deal? Are we doing an EP deal? Are we doing an album deal? You get the amount of music that you need to get to the point where you're considering a release. So a &R then, they'll work with the manager of the artist and the artist to decide sort of which single are we gonna go with. Um, this is always a really interesting time within a release and, um, other, you know, particularly in my experience, other departments often get brought into that conversation. And, and I think that makes sense because you've got a, a digital team that's going to be pitching that into Spotify. Like, well, they know, they know what's working. They know sort of some of the, 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 the trends that are happening out at Streamland. Same goes with promo. Promo, no. What, what's on the radio? Same goes with marketing. So um, often, you know, you have a collaboration, managers, uh, a and r and, and the, the, the key departments to, to decide on a single. So uh, once that single is decided, so we get to four, once that single is decided, you've got your artists and your managers decide the timeline. So that's back to artists and managers. Too many cooks on that can, can you know, really make it confusing. And, once, um, and, and in the background, once the song's been picked and the timeline start to sort of get fleshed out, then you got marketing in the background doing your visual assets. So doing your clip, doing your um, artwork, your press shots, all that kind of thing, all in readiness to try and make deadline for the release. Marketing and pro marketing then bring in promo and the publicity team right, to plot the, the release strategy. So once we've got dates, you then talk to the promo and publicity team about like, so how, how are we gonna make, a, make some noise in the market for this song? Um, do we need to uh, take the song in three weeks before it's actually out and set it up and take the artist in maybe? So maybe uh, Guy Sebastian might want to actually go in to the radio station and play it for him and talk through. This song's about uh, a, a, a friend of mine who tragically passed away and I, I you know, wrote this song and that's what this means to me. Like give some, some emotion behind it. So the promo publicity team will plot that out. We'll go, right. What, what, how are we going to, going to introduce this to our partners? Then you've got, uh, at the same time, marketing will talk to digital. So promo and digital at the same time, digital strategy, plot it out, how are we going to market, etc. Same thing. Number six, promo team in conjunction with publicity, plot out uh, what we call a promo run. So we've got the artist, okay? We need to make sure the artist is visible for the early part of this record's release and not the first day because you don't want to just go right let's just get every big breakfast show every big drive show every tv opportunity every blog every newspaper and on the first day let's just smash it out massive on release and then we're done that used to just absolutely do our heads in you have to you have to stagger a promo release so there's noise and there's activity in the market for those first at least month of a big Aussie release and that's the job of the promotions team to work with the publicist who has the artist's diary to go right this is where they can be then this is where they can be then this is how it's going to look and by four weeks we've hit everyone and this is when we feel we're going to be really peaking with the song so that's really strategic seven the song gets released right so the song's out promo plans in execution um, the, the, both the digital teams and the radio teams will start monitoring. So are we getting radio ads? If so, who's playing it? How many times are they playing it? What time of the day are they playing it? Who's not? Why not? How can we get them on? Digital do the same. Right, what playlists have we got? 
Um, did we get New Music Friday? No. Um, what pop feeder playlist like? We didn't get the big playlist, but there's a couple of pop feeder playlists that when you get on those and it performs, it will feed in. So you look at sort of where are your holes, where are your successes, and then the marketing dip back in and marketing will have a look at the overall scheme of things and say, right, this is what we need to do. We're in trouble. We didn't get the ads that we thought we we're going to get on this song. We need to tweak this marketing mix, bring all these ads, bring all the, uh, the, the sort of uh, digital ads we had, bring them forward or let's advertise on TV, whatever it might be, you'd start tweaking the marketing mix as your analysis sort of comes through. So that is, is a basic, um, you know, frontline Australian artist release. Now, now let me st absolutely stress, um, and this goes back to the, the question about you know, record deals, every release is also different. So how you would release, say, a Gang of Views record is very different to how you would release a Guy Sebastian record, it's very different to how you release a Tones and I record, uh, is how you'd release, it. like they're all different, they're all very different. So um, please don't, you know, I'm happy to take questions, but you know, this is not a one size fits all example. It, it's it's more of say a frontline artist um, for saying, or for, for a record company. Now, on the flip side of that, you've got an international. Now, the, the common thought about an international release, and let's say it's a superstar release as well. Let's, let's say it's really a big artist. That, oh, big artist, gee, you must be busy at the moment. You know, Beyonce's got a new record. Well, it's, in fact, it's actually the opposite. Because the bigger the artist, the bigger the artist is, the more um, parameters and the more communication that comes through from the international team, um, that you actually have no say on what happens. The international label team will tell you that something's coming. Right? They'll generally tell you something in advance. There's a record's coming. It's going to be big, confidential. This is this is what we're looking at. So that that all comes from your head office. In Sony's case, if it's an if it's an American release, it's New York head office. If it's a UK release, it's London. Um, the, the, when you can really get you, get excited is when you actually hear the music. So we'd always want to hear it a little bit ahead of time. And once you hear it, you can start sort of plotting your plan. Where is this going to fit? You know, is it going to fit in a commercial space? Is it going to fit in a triple J space? Is it, you know, wh wh what are we doing with this? You start plotting out, but, but you've already been told the release date. So you've already been told the release date. You've already been given, you know, your, your, your assets. You've already been uh, given the music. You're told, you know, what generally you're told what you can and can't do with marketing. So, um, what a marketing team, the, the two most important parts of, of a release for a big international are your marketing team who know the local sort of marketing um, options and tailor it to, you know, where, where they know where the right billboards are and they know sort of what the right radio stations are. So um, the marketing team play a much heavier role in an in a international release and the promo team. So the promo team, uh, it's, it's so incumbent to get radio airplay and uh, to, to get you know the ball rolling. So digital, it's all set up by the UK and the US teams. So from a big hit point or from an international song point of view, the local digital team do not have anything to do with that. They do not give it to Spotify. They do not sort of promote it to Spotify. They can follow up and ask for feedback, but they're not actually influencing any decision there. So, you know, a big, a big, big release, international release is just down to a bit of marketing, a really good marketing plan, trying to get the song on the radio. Um, and, and then similar to what happens with an Aussie release, you, once it's out, you monitor it. Is it, is it hitting the spot? Did we get the ads we wanted? Tweak the marketing mix. So I suppose the big takeout is, you know, international, a lot of it's already given to you and just, it comes down to a really good marketing plan and, uh, and, and a promo plan. So that's sort of the differences between a, an international release and a um, and a uh, an Aussie release. So Amy, I think this is where hopefully I can get to some of the, the questions around COVID um, and, and and what's coming next because uh, there's no doubt you know that that it's uh, it's an uncertain time and I'll I'll flip to here. Um, actually, you know what? I'll go back because it will distract me a little bit. Um, you know the. the there's no doubt that it's an uncertain time right now. Um, but but what I wanted to say is, you're coming out of a, la a label um, only for a matter of a handful of months ago. The, the industry, the, the record or the music industry, particularly the label um, business, is actually, and this is this is backed up by by finance um, stats, is actually as uh, as big and as uh, profitable and thriving as it ever was it, it it 
it reached a peak. So there was 15 years where it, it, it slumped, coincides with when I got into the industry, but it, it hit a slump and it's taken 15 years to get back to that point it was at before piracy. And, you know, if I've seen the um, investment going in from labels, you know, and, and that's across the labels, that's on headcount, that's on A&R, uh, a, a, the amount of signings that were happening, you know, in that last 18 to 12 uh, to, to 24 months, you know, just at Sony alone was unbelievable. You know, local Aussie signings, just bang, 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 you know, it was it was like I'd never seen in my time. And even speaking to people who've been in the industry longer than me, that there is this huge amount of optimism within the industry because of the way that the current model's working and the way that streaming has, you know, landed in a place where, and there's a lot of arguments from the artist community and, and I don't know the splits and I'm not close enough to it, but, you know, whether the, the, the royalty rates on, on streaming is acceptable. And, and, and so I don't want to enter into that because I don't know enough about it. But what I will say is that, you know, the way the model's working for, for labels and how there's that, that balance between digital and a label is starting to really even out. And if I think about YouTube, you know, YouTube were getting away with it basically a very, you know, very, favorable deal about the amount of money that they would pay for the content which generates you know ads for them and billions of dollars it, bit by bit you're, you're seeing that level out so the industry from a label point of view is is very vibrant it, it's hit a speed bump no doubt it's hit a speed bump and especially from a, a live point of view now on the live side of things absolutely like they they that has had a major impact on live and right now there are people that are going to be you know, heavily impacted by that. And I'm sure the opportunities within the live scene, you know, have, have shrunk. All right. So, so that, that is, but what I want to say is, you know, I've been there guys. I, uh, I was there in, when I was in at uni at, uh, in 2003, um, it was actually like the worst time ever to be doing a music industry course, the worst time. And I vividly remember in 2005, so this wasn't a change for so I'm saying, what, why are you getting into the music industry? They're, they're like, they're, there's actually going to be no jobs. Like, they, it's done. So, um, guys, like, yes, this is a challenging time, but trust me, if, if the industry was able to work its way out of what happened, you know, through that piracy, Given the state of play we're in right now, um, I, I think you, you have um, reason to be really optimistic about um, your opportunities that that are going to be there for you within the industry. So, um, so, so that's kind of I, I wanted to just do that off the top because I really do believe that honestly. Um, but, but the one thing also just at the bottom here, I think I should add to that is that COVID or no COVID the basic principles of, of job hunting um, are, still remain the same because, you know, you sh and, and I'll go through them, all right, and I'll tell you what I mean by that. So you've got to hustle smart, smart and you've got to hustle hard, S smart and hard. So when I say smart, don't, you, you, you just have some self-awareness, have some self-awareness about how, you know, you're going about it you don't want to be a pest and you don't want to be annoying um uh n not aware of how you know what's coming back at you some of the advice you might be getting from um from you know people as you're trying to get your foot in here foot there but there is a balance you know there's a balance of doing it hard and being you know not necessarily taking no for an answer but being tenacious without being annoying. So I think, you know, then that leads to number two, being self-aware. So just go, right, this is a passion. I'll, this is where I'm gonna get to. I'm gonna get there, I'm gonna do it smart, but you know, I'm, I'm gonna be working as hard as, harder than anyone else. I'm gonna be using, looking for X connection, X connection. I'll be, you know, I'll, I'll be looking to turn over any stone. So, and that doesn't matter if it's COVID or if it was piracy or whatever it might be. If you're working harder, if you're you're hustling harder than the next person, because th let's face it, a lot of people want to make work in the music industry. A lot of people they think it's cool, they think it's fun, um, so it's it's competitive. But you know th there are ways to put your head above the pack, and the way to do that is guys is, is network, network, network. And I just I can't stress that enough. It is such a cliche, but every job, every job that I've ever got, 
um, within this within the business has always come from networking. Every single job, from the very first um, you know the very first job I got at Shock, which was because I did uh, work experience there, to the last job I got, which was the director of promo at Sony in Sydney, and and that was because every time. I went to Sydney on, on business for, you know, cause I was based in Melbourne, but I would make it a point to go and network with that whole office, you know, and the right people in the office, the decision makers. So when they came to a point where they were looking for the next person, it, they, they would, it wasn't in Sydney. It was actually a person in Melbourne that they wanted to fly up. So, you know, bookend, all my jobs I've had, it's all about networking. Um, yeah, it's, I could go on about that all day, but um, I can't stress it enough. So if that's like not clear or anyone wants any kind of tips on networking, we'll chat about it in the Q&A. But yes, I can't, can't stress that, that enough about how important networking is. So guys, a couple of a little quick crystal balls and then we'll, we'll jump to the questions pretty soon. Um, and and you know, this is just me with gut feeling um, on it all. Um, please don't, don't uh, email me in a year's time if none of this has happened. But I think there's some, some opportunities and some trends that you may see in the next you know, six to 12 months. First one being, being streaming gigs and, and virtual festivals. And we've seen that come out of, out of necessity um, during this COVID um, situation. You know, internationally, I know, you know Miley Cyrus had the, the Global Citizen event that they did and locally, I know the, the Mushroom guy did the music from the home front. And I think what's happened is you've got promoters who are now starting to get really comfortable with that technology and, and comfortable with it as a, as a semi-alternative to a live gig. You've also got punters who are um, starting to get um, accepting of that as an as also as an alternative because it, it didn't used to be it used to be like no I'm not going to watch that on a stream like no way but given that now it's out of necessity I think that there there could be a really big opportunity now let me absolutely make it clear it's never gonna it's never going to replace the live gig uh, feeling and the feeling of a live gig the necessity for live gigs in fact I reckon post COVID live gigs going to go nuts because everyone is just going to want to get out and want to have that feeling again. But where I think there might be a, a, you know, an opening is say sold out gigs, you know, when you physically, that just absolutely, you can't get there. Well, what would be the next best thing? Pay a couple of dollars, stream it. Hey, it's not what I wanted, but it's, it's I, but it's better than nothing. Or the other one is, you know, virtual festivals, you know, so that's not going to replace the pilgrimage to Coachella. If someone wants to really go to Coachella and pay the money and have that experience, well, a virtual event's not going to, going to fulfill that, but, it could open up other things where you don't necessarily need to have, you know, 40 of the biggest acts in the world at the one place at the one time. You know, you can do festivals with everyone around the world, similar to that global event and, uh, and, and sort of monetize it in a way where, um, yeah, there, there's, there's an offering um, that, that we haven't really had or accepted in the past. Um, so keep an eye out for that. Could be interesting. Um, I think there's going to be some, you know, some really good competition in the streaming space. And yeah, I feel like that, from a label point of view, I feel like, you know, I'm talking like a label person again, because we've been saying that for a little while, but, um, you know, Spotify really do have a stranglehold. Um, Apple, you know, are inching. I think everyone thought Apple were going to make maybe a little bit of a faster run at it, but they're inching towards, you know, getting up towards that Spotify level. But, you know, there, there'll be, I think, you know, you've got companies like Amazon and, and TikTok now, the talk is TikTok are looking at their own streaming. So um, I feel like in the next, uh, and don't forget YouTube as well. Like, you know, the facts are that YouTube, more people stream music on YouTube than they do on Spotify. <laughs> so, um, you know, that's a massive, you know, you know, sleeping giant there. They're trying. They've got YouTube premium and all that YouTube music. They're trying, but yeah, watch this space. Um, I think majors and indies, the, the, the gap between them, or well, the way that majors operate is going to be more aligned. And that's, it's already been happening. I think if you look at the two, the, the, the big majors, you know, Universal have that independent distributor arm um, through a company they acquired called Caroline. They've had that, that, um, um, for a long time, but it's basically a way for Universal to, you know, run, um, you know, run a certain style of, of artist without the the big stickers of a big um, uh, independent, uh, sorry, a major record company um, across it. And similarly with with Sony, they acquired a, a company called The Orchard for, you know, I think, a quarter of a billion dollars, and basically 
the Orchard run as a, as a little subsidiary that sits inside Sony and they're like an indie. So they're an indie owned by a major. Um, but what that's allowing uh, majors to do is like I mentioned earlier, is, is tailor deals to every single different artist. So, you know, you're, you're not giving away as much. You're not, so the artists aren't giving away as much of their pie, but they're still consigned to a major, utilize certain you know, facets of a major, their distribution, their promotions team, their connections, without having to sort of give away probably as much as what artists might have had to do in the past. And that's why you've got the likes of, you know, Tones and I, Tash Sultana, those types of artists, you know, um, signing with, with Sony um, when historically they would probably go down an, an indie path. Um, um, Amy, you know, to your point earlier, I, I do think that, you know, commercial radio will increase their support of Australian artists. There is, as I mentioned, definitely a, um, a focus point for ARIA at the moment and, and it's like tightening up, it's tightening up, they're getting the rules in place and, I think radio are starting to come on board and they're seeing that as, an, uh, as a potential like a um, point of difference because you could argue that the streaming, um, the streaming platforms are skewed towards uh, internationals more. Certainly their charts are. Um, if you look at the charts, a lot of, it's very, very hard to get Australian artists just given, you know, the way playlisting works and algorithms to get Australian artists towards the top of the Spotify chart is, is extremely difficult. So Australian radio see that as, could see that as a little bit of a, an, an opportunity to go, all right, well, well, this might be our chance. Australian music, the quality of Australian music getting made is as good as it has ever been. Certainly from that crossover point of view, playing it, you know, from a worldwide, from a commercial radio, from a triple J, it's as strong as it's ever been. So opportunity there for commercial radio. This one, a bit of a speculator, um, but you know, the rock music and and for the you know handful of, of last years that I was at Sony, you know, we'd had the odd you know, Foo Fighters record that would go nuts, and from a local point of view, Gang of Youth certainly were, were the, the the torchbearer for us. Um, Birds of Tokyo have, have had their moment, um, and internationally, you had bands like Maroon Five be rock artists and turn into pop. You had Imagine Dragons be pop, a rock artist and turn into pop. I just think that there's there's world might be ready for a moment of like of that real kind of grungy rock music to to have a moment back in the pop world. And all it's going to take is is something to come out of online or some really special younger style artist that connects. You know, like similar like with what One Direction did. Boy, boy bands hadn't been around for ages, and it just took sort of one thing to happen. And then we've been stuck with boy bands, you know, for, for a decade after. So I feel like rock music has been out of the, the real pop commercial world. You know, it's probably since you know, Kings of Leon had a, had a huge moment, um, you know, maybe a decade ago. I think there could be something um, coming in, uh, in, in the next little bit. So last bit, guys, before we can jump into the question um, and answer, some resources, I think... Um, uh, would be great for, for from a label point of view to be across. Certainly, we used to, you know, religiously be looking at these things, and you're probably across a lot of them. But really quickly, um, you know, the music business worldwide was a was a daily routine. You know, that it's a great, uh, really reputable um, blog or website publication newsletter. Um, predominantly stories about the labels, um, the labels interactions with streaming. Uh, it's, it has editorial pieces, it, 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 it news breakers, it has staff movements, it has trans, it's great one-stop shop. Um, doesn't bombard you with stuff. So do like, make sure you, you, you at least sort of put that in your favorites and check that out. If, if you're interested in radio and the radio landscape internationally, um, all access um, music group is a free website it's a newsletter you can subscribe to and it's literally got every single chart of, of us radio all the sort of most added rock radio pop radio adult radio awesome sort of resource for, for us in a promo team just to see what was coming from international um, the music network is is a locally curated uh, website which focuses as like brings radio and label together so really good one-stop shop of what's happening at the predominantly like the, the oh, no, i suppose majors and indies um but yeah how you know how majors and indies are impacting at radio so in in australia 
So that's the music network. Radio Today, so that, that's not a label thing. That's just specifically um, like a site with news and um, stories and gossip about um, the radio industry, which I found really um, useful when you go into a radio station to know what was happening. You know, if there was a big brand relaunch or there was a staff change or whatever that might be, really um, you know, handy to, to have a finger on the pulse. Uh, these two down here, Tone Deaf and, and the music, for me, that was my sort of connection to, to slightly the more alternative um, scene. So, um, yeah, again, I feel like they don't sort of bombard you too much, but always good just to dip in there and, and see um, what Aussie stuff was uh, really popping. And, and last but, but not least, and, and, you know, you could argue you, you shouldn't do this, but, you know, Spotify charts was one. It was just really sort of interesting to try and track some trends. And, you know, it certainly early days the the trend of uh of, of internet um of hip-hop and r&b you know starting to to explode and this is going back a couple of years now but you could see what was happening on you know on streaming services and there was actually a moment with latin as well so the latin markets really um sort of yeah really took to, to streaming we could see that it was infiltrating the the sound of what was going on here so I find it, I used to find it really interesting to, to look at the Aussie charts and, and see what was, um, you know, what's popping and, and how hard Australian, you know, it is for Aussies to, to try and get up that chart. So key takeaways, um, guys, last promise, this is uh, nearly the last slide. Um, if you have to, I think this is really gone for, for an hour and a half, but guys, if there's, if there's something, if there's four things I want you to take away, let's let, let it be these, be, be super positive. Um, about your job prospects, um, you know, outside of once you finished your education, because, um, you know, for anyone who works hard, I can, I can really assure you that there are a lot of opportunities out there um, and, and be passionate about it because I mentioned earlier, it's a, it's a really um, competitive industry and those who really want it and you can tell, you can tell when you get someone who come in who, you know, might just have someone they know in the industry and come along versus someone that, that really just, desperately wants to be in it. So I think what gets noticed is positivity and passion in that job hunt. Got to network, network, network. Um, you know, don't, it, it, yes, it's um, people within the industry, but you know what? Sometimes it's not with people not in the industry. Like the, the first the first big connection I made was a GM at, at Nova, general manager at Nova radio station. And how I made that connection was a neighbor across the road knew Rove McManus's brother and a neighbor across the road knew Rove McManus's brother and she put me in touch with Rove McManus's brother. Rove McManus's brother said, you don't want to be a manager. You probably want to get in a radio or a label. Here's a number, call a person at Nova. And that, that started things like that was how that networking worked. It wasn't, it's not about knowing the promotions person at Sony Music. Yes, it helps and build it, build it up. But when you find one person, right, how can you, or how does that spiral out? How do you get to the next person, the next person? It's not always the, it's not always the obvious contact. Sometimes it's, it's the, it's the one that's a bit left field that, that can be the, the silver bullet that you need. So network, 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 and, and really be lateral in your networking. Um, be strategic, be patient, strategic with your career progression. So as I mentioned earlier, the, you know, the, the, Interns kind of came in and sort of didn't want to do the hard yards. You know, it, it's just it doesn't work. And you know, you, there's there's a balance of of being um, sort of patient without getting the you know the Mickey taken out of you, so to speak. Um, having people take advantage of you because of your passion. So it's so so when I say be strategic, be, do do jobs if you are you know in a position to intern, volunteer, work for you know minimal you know whatever it might be. Take a second job. Make sure it's something that's going to be a stepping stone to where you want to get to. And again, be lateral because it might not be at, you know, oh, well, I want to get to a major, so I want to work at an indie. It might be there's a job going at, at um, a, um, a t and &E station or a, a film company, you know, Village Roadshow have got something in their promo team or their accounts team, whatever it might be. So I was we were faced with a situation where the intern was at Sony, and um, you know the job the job wasn't on offer. And um, sorry, there's an intern at Sony. There was no job on offer for her once she finished, and she worked part time at a retail store. And I was sort of keeping an eye. There was this job at, at the Roadshow, 
And I, I said, hey, this is like, so there's nothing at Sony. Have a crack at this job. This is a lateral movement that will at least get you entertainment experience. You don't know who you might meet. It gets you a step closer to a label. Um, and she said, no, she goes, no, a label's what I want to do. I'm not going for that job. I'm just going to keep working at the retail. And I, I just, I said, well, working in the clothes shop's not going to get you any closer to the, to the your goal. Um, and that was her decision and that's cool, but that's what I mean by being strategic. So be lateral, be strategic. It might not be a direct step to where you want to get to, but you know, just if you've got the plan and you've got the vision of where you want to get to, just um, you know, be, have a, uh, yeah, be strategic is, is what I'll say. Happy to take more questions on that. Lastly, guys, yeah, working out, like, uh, working out a label is, a, is an absolute dream job. And, and I, I thought it was when I was at JMC, like with you guys and um, uh, my, my lecturer, um, Abby, her name was, she, you know, I, she said, oh, you'd be great in promo. And I, from then I sort of you know, looked into it and thought, oh, maybe that's what I'll, I'll go for. And that seems like I want, what I want to do. I want to make a career out of um, my passion, which was music and entertainment. Um, my skill set was a bit more businessy. So I thought, well, that's what I'm going to merge that's what I want to do. And, and having done it for 15 years now, it, guys, it's awesome. It's, it's what you're putting yourself through at JMC to get the, um, you know, to get the education to, to follow that dream. If it's a label or, or guys, I saw a lot of some recording equipment, Marx is doing the, the scratching. If it's being an artist or whatever it is, like getting in this industry, it is unreal. It is awesome. It's worth the, you know, the effort that you guys are putting in. Um, so, so yeah, passionate and positive and, and, and go for it. Um, so that's it guys. Thanks for, for letting me, me have a chat. I hope, um, and I hope that, that in amongst the, the, you know, 20 odd people or whoever, however many are listening uh, and you all come from different you know, sections of, of what you want to do. Hopefully there's something there that, that was a little bit insightful of my time working at, at a couple of different labels and, um, uh, like you know, um, Amy said, happy to, to have a chat now and, and do my best to answer as much as I can. And guys, I'm not going to BS you if, if I don't know something. And, and uh, but you know, it's a really great question. I'm more than happy to uh, to sort of step away and, and get emails and come back to you. So um, thanks heaps, and, and uh, yeah, look forward to to having a having a little chat now. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much, Rowan. Um, yeah, we've we've had most of our listeners stay on, so I'm guessing there's some keen questions coming up. But I just want to say I really, really value those sentiments you said in 2003 when um, piracy was all the thing and, and the music industry was in a bad state. You just sort of, you saw it grow back to where it was pre-piracy and, you know, the role that streaming played and now, you know, where live streaming will kind of fill you know, goal, um, the gaps in the live music space that are to come. Um, so yeah, I found that really interesting. Um, so I hope everyone's thinking up some questions right now. Um, we've got 32 people with us. Um, I guess I wanted to ask one question about the structure of major labels. Do you think that in these um, COVID times that there'll be new job creations around live stream concerts? Um, in like digital teams yeah i do i do amy but i don't think that sits within a record label i think that's mm -hmm. more for um for promoters so yeah. you know for, for, for those guys um out there to, to like distinguish it really clearly so a label you know sits here label sits here and they're you know the, the essence of of signing artists recording music putting out you know recorded music the promoters are, are, are in the live business so they're about gigs and festivals and concerts a company like front I made a company like Mushroom. They have um, two different arms. So they run Liberation, um, which is their label arm, and then they run Frontier. But yeah, um, Amy, to answer your question, um, I, I do I do think that there will be um, an opportunity there for, for growth in that um, part of a, of, a, of a promoter. All right, awesome. Um, thanks. <laughs> was, yeah. Um, are there any questions coming through in the chat here? Um, we've got a couple of comments. Um, I, I'm like more of a personal question is talking about, you know, you loving working a label and being in it for 15 years. Mm -hmm. What are some of your more personal sort of sparkle career moments where you're just like, wow, this was awesome. Um, th yep. Uh, there's, there's a lot, uh, but a couple uh, when Pharrell Williams, so I'm a, I, I love um, R&B, you know, R&B, pop R&B, hip hop. That's, that's my sweet spot. 
um, certainly growing up, listened to a heap of, of Pharrell Williams and NERD and all the pop stuff that Pharrell produced. Um, like literally get lucky, not get lucky, um, happy, happy had just exploded. Um, and, and Pharrell had written the, the um, score to the Despicable Me. He was up for an Oscar. Um, he didn't win the Oscar in the end. But we'd organised for him, literally, he left the Oscars party and got on a plane and came to Australia. And he hosted a listening session for his album Girl um, for like a handful of people. And he, he literally got up and he, he sat up. Well, he didn't want to stay up on the stage because he thought he looked like an idiot. But he initially was on the stage and then he just he pressed play on every song on, on this, this album Girl and, uh, and, and talked like, this is the genius Pharrell Williams. And just talked to us like we were in in his mates and uh, it, that 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 for me i reckon was all time um it, like yeah just because you know it was an artist i loved and it was an insight into sort of this this creative genius um that that was one i just will never will never forget that one and a pretty cool one um was was spending a bit of time uh, with with Bruce Springsteen in a um, in a hotel lobby, which was a pure fluke, mm. pure fluke. Uh, <clears throat> uh, yeah, it, it was when Tom Morello was touring with Bruce Springsteen uh, for his E Street Band, and um, Tom was he's just a party animal. He needed someone to take him out, so I get this call from my head office saying, "Hey, Tom Morello wants to go out somewhere. Can you go to the hotel and um, and and take him out somewhere?" So it was like what one o'clock in the morning or something. So I quickly went down to the hotel that I was staying at and uh, rang the guys at Cherry Bar and said, oh, listen, Tom Morello wants to come. Can, you know, can we do something? So all good, sort of that out. But when I went to pick him up and Bruce Brisson hadn't, I think he did something like 40 shows that tour. He hadn't been like out. Like Tom had hardly even seen him. Tom had seen him on the stage to play with him, but he hadn't really seen him in a social setting. Mm. And anyway, we, I walk in to go and get Tom and Tom's sitting with Bruce Springsteen at the, um, at the at the hotel bar um so i got yeah i got to kind of hang with them and have a couple of drinks with them which and, and i'm saying there's people within the sony family who have been there for like literally 40 50 years one of our chairman worked there they've never had that kind of interaction with Bruce mm. Bruce before so that was a that was a pretty cool one as well yeah cool okay um thanks thanks for sharing that i mean there's not too many questions coming through so i'll go through a couple of old ones um, there was one asking about independent artists, um, how to get songs on the radio if you're an independent artist, how to go about that. What would you do? Yeah, I, tr I think Triple J, I'm, I'm sure you've gone down this path, but yeah, Triple J Unearthed is, is such a, you know, such a lucky, well, Triple J in general is such a lucky, um, oh, sorry, a valuable commodity that we have in Australia and every, every manager, you know, to, to a person, when they, international manager would come to Australia and if their artist was, say, skewed Triple J wise, would tell us how lucky we are to have a, a national broadcaster unencumbered by commercial, you know, um, you know, um, you know commercial pressures mm. um, and with this uh, such a thriving and well-reputable um, feeder system as, as unearthed, um, you know, we, 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 there's nothing like that anywhere in the world. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I know it's a competitive space, but if I'm talking about sending in, you know, do everything, you know, send a demo. So if you're an indie, send a demo to, to, to a major record label, no problem, you know, contact, try and get a contact at A&R at, at a major, no problem. But I think, you know, Triple J Unearth is just such a powerful tool. Um, it, you know, getting an independent just going on their own, trying to get through to commercial radio, in all honesty, is, is tough. It's super tough. I won't say it's impossible, but it is, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. There are that many layers around commercial that you need to get through to just do it yourself as an artist. You could go and, you know, employ an um, independent publicist, you know, and there are many independent publicists that do that. But, um, you know, if you're, you're an independent artist and, and your music, you think your music skews that Triple J way, you know, don't think, oh, Triple J on earth, it's, it's, uh, it's what everyone, like, it is a legitimate 
uh, <clears throat> talent por uh, 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 portal. And someone asked earlier about how do labels find artists. I can guarantee you now that a and R people at major record companies trawl through on Earth. Mm. That's a hot. That's a very hot tip. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for that. Is, it, is there any? Does everyone just chuck their mics on and and speak? We're all the sun has gone down in Melbourne. The people still use press kits. Like, do you still go through that stuff? Marks, um, if they're really special. Um, sometimes using a press kit can be good to cut through um, because, because mate, not many people are doing it. To answer your question, no, it's not something usual that we would see. Um, however, if it's done well and if there's something different about it, if there's something creative about it, you know, I'm talking about as a promo person, we're looking at things to cut through the noise. You know what? A really sort of slick press kit and it doesn't have to be expensive it can be creative and something smart um yeah you know they're, they're, i would i would absolutely say if you've got the you know the, the creativity to to want to do something like that and 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 the resources to do something like that i would the, my, my thing would be make it special don't just do like a run of the mill here's my bio here's a cd here's a here's a uh, um what is it? A six by nine press pad or whatever they used to be when I was at shock. But um, yeah, mate, I, got so, a, I got a few old school press kits from some old friends. Yeah. yeah, yeah uh, mate. They're and, all heaps different from each other. Yeah. that's good. And that's good because you, uh, Hey, what are I, I talk about, about um, you know, the music industry being a back to the future industry and you know, that that's very that's retro. Kind of, yeah, exactly. And that's the kind of stuff, like that's the kind of stuff that, you know, bounces back. It, 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 what will happen? You know what will happen, Marks? Someone will send a kick-ass um, press kit in, all right? And and it will get, you know, a bit of publicity about, oh, you know, this person... Press kits will become popular. Press, press kits will become popular. A new way. Record companies will get bombarded with press kits and then people will do them badly and all that kind of thing. But, but yeah, that's... that's um, I have another question about yeah, sure. um, getting experience. So, like... Just say you don't have too many contacts in the music industry and you want to go about making those contacts sure. besides school. So, for example, I actually like live near Warner Music or maybe it's moved, but I'm still probably pretty close to it. Would it be a good idea to go in and offer my help like specifically yeah, via email or and or person like canvassing? Absolutely, Marks. It would be. All right. And this is about having that self-awareness. Go in there. All right. And, and present your best. When I say present your best picture i don't i'm not saying put on a suit but you know know your stuff so know everything about warner know know what who their hot artists are go on music network and see what what warner artists are getting played on the radio because you can very easily you know check that it's got the record companies next to so know your stuff come like, as a fan there. yeah and and and, and go and, and and suss it out because they might just go you know it depends on on who the person is actually not yeah you know, the the there, there will be people who are opened, and and I was absolutely I loved having uh, help and experience and and work experience. People come through, and there'll be people that don't want it. It's too hard. Don't. So you've got to pick up on that. So yes, absolutely. If you live close to Warner, go in at Warner. Know your stuff about Warner. All right. Know what songs they're working. Know like know their artists and love their artists. You know this is the promo in me, but you know why don't love African yeah. Child? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you know, like, you know, get on, like, oh, that record's, you know, you, you, there's promo people and record labels, they want to hear good stuff about their own thing. So, um, yeah, yes, I would say go and do one of music. The other thing I'd say about, you know, where are you going to find these these contacts? Um, you know, look, luckily, but, but I mean, it's, gigs isn't a bad place to start. Really tough at the moment, I know, in Melbourne, because we can't do that. But, um, yeah, uh, you know, thinking about our COVID situation and it's not going to be forever, you know, it's going to be for this next little period, but we have to adapt a little bit. So the email and the, and, and maybe is it, you know, sending a video, you know, instead of an email, all right, if you're going to, if you're going to email uh, Warner Music and say, Hey, I can, like, instead of just emailing it, do a, do a quick little video, do a quick little video and they can see you, they can connect with a bit better. They, they know you've gone to the, the, the effort. I don't know if that's going to work, Marks, but at least it's showing it's you trying to go above. It's trying to cut through. It's an attempt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, um, so, yeah, a little tricky at the moment given uh, COVID, but th th like the, the hustle. There's other ways. The know? direct approach is good. Um, 
to start with. The direct approach is definitely good to start with and then assess it. And then assess, if, if you don't hear anything from someone, don't email them the next day and go, hey, I emailed you about a work experience, didn't hear back from you, any any new, no, nah, see, you know what I mean? I can see you smiling, self-awareness, all right? You know that's not what you're gonna do. But you gotta start somewhere. And if you don't ask, you don't know. So, you know, a really, um, you know, a, a self-aware email, passionate email, uh, or, or video or whatever it might be to say, this is where I'm at. If, if you get their attention straight away, great. If you don't, put it on ice for a bit, look at other avenues, maybe come back to it later. But yeah, direct approach to start, I, I would say, and everyone's different, but I would say I love that. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, is there anyone else who'd like to jump on the mic? If there's any in the, in the chat box you want to throw at me for the last little bit, Amy, happy to do anything like that? Um, we've got a, a more broad question from um, Galti. Uh, what would you say is the minimum level of exposure before an artist can get that ball rolling? Ah, minimum level of exposure. So is, is the person who asked that question still there? Because I just want to ask a follow-up question. Have a quick look. Um, no, that's okay. The, the reason why I want to ask just, is, oh no, they're, they're they're there. Um, do you want to elaborate? Uh, yeah, yeah. Sorry. So the question that I would ask in return is, what what's ball like? The, the definition of ball rolling, like what 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 specifically are, are we are you referring to on that? Because it's like, is it getting a deal? Is it getting radio airplay? Is it starting a tour? Is it making money out of the whole venture? Like, there's a there's a few different kind of aspects to the starting point. Okay, so we've just got um, the response in the chat was um, more views, getting more views. So I'm guessing uh, more views. Are you talking about video? Yeah. Okay. More views. I, I think with more views, it's uh, it's about well, first of all, it's about um, consistency of content. That that is like I'm sure you know they've been taught this in your lectures and all that. But you know, when you're trying to build a, a profile, um, an online profile, a digital profile, a video profile, you need to be really consistent with your content, and it needs to be good as well. So that's the first thing, right? You've got to have engaging, like. Think of what's out there and go, well, wow, what, what can I do that's a little bit different and a little bit better? What, what are people liking at the moment? Right? What's working? What can I do? So consistent flow of content. So people will want to subscribe because they know like every couple of days or whatever, they're going to see something new. Um, and, and, and also it goes back to networking. So bit by bit, like if, if you're in that sort of creation space and you've got other people that are there and they might have a few followers, it's about just trying to, you know, bit by bit, pull them in. Um, I'd say those three things, um, consistency of content, engaging content, and, um, and trying to fan it out. All right, awesome, thanks for that. Um, maybe one last question, sure. is anyone around? Just pop your mic off. Okay, well, we might just wind it up a couple of minutes oh. early. Um, but that was huge. It was so um, thorough. And it's been recorded. So uh, a few people had to jump off at five o'clock to go to their evening classes. So hopefully oh, we'll cool. be able to watch back um, later. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Um, if anyone's got some special thanks for Rowan, chuck it in the chat now. Um, that was awesome. That was so, um, so insightful. And coming at it from, you know, the perspectives that you have was so useful. Um, and also just, yeah, it's, it's good for us to hear, you know, at, right now at this particular moment um, when we're sort of sitting down. I know there's a lot of music students who actually joined us tonight, um, probably more so even than the music business students. So oh, I right. think a lot of students are really working on their records, working on their songs over the, you know, lockdown. And then it's like planning the next steps from there. So... Cool. Thank you so much. Um, have a great night. Uh, take care. We've yeah. got heaps of thanks coming through. Thanks heaps. Thanks so much, mate, from Billy. Uh, thanks from Chester. Thanks for the talk. Yep. Awesome. Yeah, awesome. And, and, and Amy, just, um, you know, if guys, if there's anything, you know, specific, you know, that you want to follow up, um, 
I always, I never, I never ask questions on these things either. I always got too shy. But you know, if there's something, just flicking through to Amy and and um, Amy, if you want to just correlate a few, and I'd be happy to kind of come back and, and get back to anyone that that needs a little bit of extra, um, you know, detail on any of this. But yeah, just be positive, guys. You know, whether it's the music students or the music business students, it's it's a really good time out there in the industry. COVID will, COVID's a bump, and and we'll get on the other side of it. Um, but uh, yeah, just um, yeah, bring a lot of positivity to, to what you do, and, and yeah, I'm, I'm sure you all go really well. Good luck with it all. Good luck with the, the study. Awesome. Okay, thanks so much. We'll um, we'll let you head off. Uh, my email's in the chat if anyone wants to follow up on that offer. Um, yeah, have a great night. Cool. See you, everyone.